Hello guys, we are back. Um, we've changed the angle of our camera so you can see us a little bit, but you won't get to look at the back of our heads again. But this is the important thing, so we want to show you um, how we're going to be laying this up. This is HydroCal uh, we're using because it's very hydrophilic, like I mentioned before. It sucks a lot of the moisture out um, when you're doing the latex part of the casting. So we did give this the spray of the 13 10 dulling spray, um, and it's been drying maybe 10 minutes or so. So now we are going to be mixing up our hydrocal. We have our brushes that have already been weeded, thanks to our wonderful Chelsea. Um, Chelsea is here with us again, as well as Ted Buffum. And uh, at this stage, we're going to be um, doing a print coat, which is fairly uh, thin viscosity. Um, but our idea with this phase is to basically just get a thin coat on here. It, it, you really go by feeling after a while as far as the viscosity and how liquidy it should be. Um, again, since this is vertical, we do have to make it a little bit thicker than I would like because we have all this detail in here, and especially in these gills that we have to work with. But we'll show you some tricks on um, getting that worked out to where you... Uh, have less of a chance for bubbles. Um, you can either use canned air or uh, air compressor, but basically that's that's the long and short of it. Um, I think we have the. Do we have the little um, the vibrator down yeah, there? Right here. Um, get your minds out. Yeah, get your minds out of the gutter. Um, we're going to be using um, a small dental vibrator or dental agitator. That'll get some of the air bubbles out. Um, as we go. Uh, Grayson A. Jones says, who's that woman working on the mold? Clearly she's the boss. Yes, that's that's Chelsea. And we, we can embarrass her. No, no. No, no, no? No, no, no embarrassment. Uh, 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 there she is. Give a wave. Don't be I, upset. I'm not upset. Don't be upset. I'm not upset. We love, we love our Chelsea. Okay. No, so, so we have a little bit of power that will probably give you a resonant vibration sound on your end. Oh, I hope it doesn't oscillate the camera. <laughs> I hope not. If it, if it looks like a, a small earthquake, it's just the vibrator. But we use that once we mix up our material, we put it on that to kind of release some of the air bubbles. So all these old little tricks. That is not. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and get it started. What you can't see off camera is we're using... Spin the camera. Let's see if we can spin it around here. Not that one. The whole thing, maybe. Oh, you're getting in. Yep. Good. We're going to be mixing up the hydrocal. This is done typically a one-part water to two parts hydrocal. We're going with a print coat. So some of it is going to be, um, you know, by feel. We want it to be a certain texture. Shouldn't be too thick at this point because we want to capture as much detail as we can. Was that a one to do? Uh, that's uh, two to four. Oh, oh, two cups of water. So that was two cups of water to four cups of, of powder. Um, so it's going to be a, a little bigger batch than we need probably. We're going with a very thin batch on this because we got to keep that vertical. So the more material you throw on it, the more it's going to want to slop off, and we're just going to have a pile of plaster at the bottom. Tom, there are only keys on one wall to prevent locking. Yeah, we got to just be sure to be able to get it out. So we'll probably have to use a trick after the fact. Maybe drill a couple of holes with a with a masonry bit through and just anchor it. I'm nervous about putting keys on both sides because then when we try to get it out, um, we may have issue with locking or scraping the sides of the mold together. So you see as he um, continues to add the powder, it reaches somewhat of a saturation point, and it takes more time for it to soak the water up. That's perfectly normal. We actually want that to do that. 
and you can't rush this process. You have to make sure that you uh, add an appropriate amount of material. You notice he stopped about two thirds through that cup. And what we're looking at here is all around this area, you see that there are wet puddles and then there are more matte areas like in here that have a dry cracked earth look to it. And we're waiting for the water to absorb into the powder. We don't want the, um, you know, to mix in the dry material because then you get all these wicked clumps and it's very hard to get a, a smooth, creamy batter like consistent consistency when we're putting that on the sculpt. And this is the, uh, this is where the rubber meets the road because if your mold at this point, your beauty coat, your, or not your beauty coat, your, your uh, uh, detail coat, if that is not a good coat, if it's too thick, if it's too thin, you could have all sorts of issues with your your cast piece. So it really is uh, a, a bit of science. You have to make sure that you get it done right. And you see how it's really looking dry crack now? Before we add the rest of that um, hydrocal, we're going to wait until this absorbs completely. And then we are going to mix it and check our consistency. And from there, we only have... Um, maybe 10 minutes working time, 10, 15, if we're lucky. Of course, if you're using distilled water and you chill it, it's going to give you more time. But in this situation, it's not necessarily something that would benefit us. If we have more time, chances are it could actually slop and fall off of the sculpt. So we're looking for a good consistency, not too thick, not too thin. Right now it's very, very watery, but we're, we have a lot of that mass at the bottom of the pan. So we're waiting to see how that's going to mix up. This is all the, the behind the scenes stuff that you don't get to see on shows like Face Off. When I was on that, a lot of people said, you know, what happens behind the scenes? Because, holy crap, we move so quickly, yeah. But they cut out all the boring stuff like this where you're mixing up material and waiting it for, for it to cure. So you can see now it looks very matte. The layer that he put on last is kind of absorbing in, it's reaching its saturation point. Distilled water is going to act different than well water or municipal water. So really, wherever you are, you have to kind of practice with your materials and see how they react. But if you get to the point where this stuff is already starting to heat up, you're losing precious time as far as your application. So far, the consistency is looking pretty good. It could be a little thicker, I think. It's looking kind of like a heavy cream at this point. It's looking like an unchilled custard. Not quite a flummery. <laughs> but I think, let me go ahead and feel consistency. Yeah, I could probably use just a touch more, not much more than that, because if we do more, it's going to be so thick, and we run the risk of it not falling into all those little scale details. So this is probably going to be the last little bit we're going to want to add, because like with, with plasters, more water is going to make them set weak. Less water will also weaken it. So you can't use less water and think, oh, well, I just need a really, really thick batch. Um, it could be powdery and weak. <clears throat> Whereas if you get that sweet spot, you have maybe a 10% window to play with as far as your viscosity. Yes, Tom Murphy. Um, I had mentioned the, the uh, distilled water before. Distilled water has nothing added to it. Like if you use municipal water and um, well water, there are always minerals in there like salt or whatever that could make it set different, you know? Salt, iron. Yeah, so, iron, uh, yeah. especially if you have a well or, or calcium. Calcium in there and fluoride they add to municipal water. Oh, yeah, that's fair. Um, Rebecca McGillicuddy, do you need to be concerned about room temperature? Yes. If you're in a hotter environment, this stuff is going to go off faster. <laughs> if we find that this is going really, really quick for us and we can't really get an adequate layer on, 
what we can always do is use ice cubes in the water and kind of chill it down a little bit. Um, but that's a case per case. Okay, I think this is a good texture, a good viscosity. You can see it's very heavy cream now at this point. So we can actually start getting um, the material on there. I'm going to move it over to the dental agitator. And what we're doing is we're just letting some of that gentle vibration to bring that up bring those air bubbles up. Alcohol works really good to break the bubbles. If you don't have uh, alcohol, you can always use a little bit of water, but alcohol will uh, evaporate off, and sometimes adding water gives you a little bit of a slick to it. Now, this is preventative because you're always going to, you, when you use your brush and you put it on there, you're going to get air bubbles and stuff, so you do have to be careful with that. But... Pretty much it's just about getting the bulk of those bubbles and the small bubbles that congregate, breaking them into bigger bubbles that can come to the surface. And you don't have to leave it on for a very long time because you're in your pot life. So if it starts to go off and you lose a whole batch, you've blown it. You know, So it's, it's definitely a, a balancing act. can see all those bubbles coming to the surface. You spray a little of the liquid on there and they break up and then others are able to come up in their place. You can also tap it on the ground, tap the bucket on the ground to release some of those air bubbles, but sometimes it just splashes all over the place. <laughs> Grayson made a great comment. Seeing the uh, mundane mixing and whatnot actually makes the process seem a little less intimidating. That's, uh, that's true with just about anything. Once you see it done and you see that, hey, I could do that. That's, that's why uh, you know artists like, um, oh my God, anyone that you used to watch on TV, Bob Ross is probably one of the most popular. But seeing the process and seeing what to watch for and actually seeing failures can oftentimes help with uh, the beginner that's trying to get into it. Okay, I think that's about all the time we want to invest in vibrating it. We still have some air bubbles, but that does limit some of the others that are in there. Gentle, gentle mixing just to make sure that we have a good creamy mix. <clears throat> What's that? It's the usual Debbie Jeff. Uh, pretty much. We make sure that we weed the brush, get all the little extra bristles out, and then we're going to just dip in, and we're going to work from the top and the mold wall, because we do want to get some on the mold wall. And this is only the print coat, so important is we got to make sure that we're jabbing in on all those detail areas, because that is where we got to get perfect reproduction. And if you work from the top down, you're not going to be fighting gravity. gravity. You know, it's going to be working as much as it can to your advantage. But you want that nice, creamy coat. You see that coat that we've got there? Um, sometimes, like especially once we get a little bit on, um, you'll see that we go back in and do a little bit of um, air, canned air. But we're going to be going back and forth and trying to you know, get out all the air bubbles, and by the time we get to a certain point, we're going to find that the material itself is starting to cream, and that means that the the material, the the plaster, starts to change consistency from a very liquidy consistency to something that's more, um, you know, like a pancake batter, say. And at that point, we can go back in and splash some on the top, so we're not going to be losing detail. And again, this is why we go through the process of putting a sealer coat. We've got an air gap under there. Um, you know, because now we're brushing on to the piece. We want to be sure to be able to hit that without actually causing damage to the sculpt itself. The reproduction has to be pretty, pretty darn flawless. We're paying attention to that cutting edge, kind of wiggling the brush back and forth. 
so we can get all the details filled. And around here especially, you kind of want to go into the sculpture with kind of a tapping motion. And that's going to fill in all those little gaps in the scales that he has. Change your angle so we're actually tucking in. And you see what I mean how this, this hydrocal, as it hits this area of the sculpt, rather than it beating up and falling away from our sculpt, it's staying where we put it. And that's because of the surface tension that, we're create, that we created by spraying the wax release. It increases the surface tension and gives some sort of tooth for the hydrocal to stick to. And I'm even going to get a soft brush, one that's just a little bit softer, natural fiber, or a, a synthetic fiber, but a little bit softer, and just catch some of these thin spots up here. Because if it's too thin, what can often happen is it starts to dry out just from the air, not going through a curing process, but it starts to dry up. All the way down to it? Yes. Yeah. All right, baby. Cool. Thank you, Mark. But you can see that if we keep that moving, this is kind of like a cement truck as well, in that when you have a cement truck, you know how it's constantly moving. The more you play with your, your plaster as it sets, it's not going to set. It's going to kind of stay in that creamy consistency. But we're just chasing air bubbles and making sure that we don't get any kind of cliffs or anything like that. Good and bad. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we are fighting. You see up here where the moisture kind of flows down, it's starting to ash already. But that's not because of the chemical process yet. That is because it's so thin there that it's starting to cream and do its thing. So without really messing it up, you want to add a little bit more material. You do have to be very careful of creating air bubbles and air pockets in the keys and in the 45 degree angles of the mold wall. Uh, 90 degree. 90 degree, I'm sorry. 90 degree angles of the mold wall. Because if you get a mold uh, a bubble in that area, you're going to have all sorts of problems. It'll fracture along that cutting edge, and then you'll have a wart that you always have to clean out of every casting after that. No fun. No. Nope. And at this point, when I'm putting it on there, I am also doing a little bit of um, tapping, kind of like the old-fashioned splash coats. Where did I put it? I thought it was right there. A little bit of canned air is going to make sure that we got all of the air bubbles out as we move that stuff around going to burp. It basically breaks the surface tension. So far, everything looks really good. I think we got a good mix of viscosity. Okay, yeah, that looks good. Okay, and if I'm feeling my bucket, it is starting to get a little bit warmer than room temperature. It's not there yet, but it's getting there. Layering. Yeah, let's stay away from the gills, mm -hmm. but we're going to keep layering a little bit more on the walls. Keep it from ashing completely. Yes. And the thing we really want to be careful with with this is when it ashes, it's more likely to delaminate from itself. Certain products like Hydrocal and Ultracal, the Alpha Gypsums, they have less of a propensity for um, delamination. But if you were doing this, we do um, several molds in casting plaster. And that is very, very hydrophilic. It wants to suck all of the moisture out of the um, latex or the casting material that you're putting in it. But it also is very brittle and doesn't like to stick to itself very well. So again, this is your splash coat. This is your first, your detailed print coat. So it doesn't have to be too thick. 
but we do want to make sure that we have enough thickness that when we put on our next coat, that number one, it has a little bit of uh, draw to it, that it's not just putting material on um, another, you know, thin surface. Starting to go cool whippy. Cool whippy. Yes, that's a good term. Um, this is where it's definitely hitting that creaming, creaming feel to it. It's also where you're most likely to get weird little peaks and waves in the light. Yeah. And it's about breaking surface tension and giving enough base that also when you do your next coat, you're not pulling material off. But we really got to be careful with where we got it? I got it. Under there? Yeah. Okay. Pretty sure that it's also going to pop. <laughs> yeah. If there's going to be a problem, it's going to be under here because that area wants to fall away from it. So we got to play with that and get all of the air burped out. Should we Jackson Pollock it? <laughs> um, probably not at this point. Next one, yes. But we probably mixed up too much of a batch on that last one because this was just a print coat. But... When we get to the next one, we're probably just going to mix in one cup, and that will be our final small batch. But we got good coverage on the base. I see no undercuts or things that we have to worry about material not being able to get into, because if we created some sort of weird peak in there that we couldn't get, material into then all of a sudden we have a problem with a um, <laughs> yeah getting strength in there <clears throat> and again a very very soft fan brush just working out some of those gaps and air bubbles that we have trapped here yeah. we had a stringy bit there And the fan brushes are good because they're so soft and so fine that they will often push material into the the, de the depths, the valleys of the sculpt, but they'll still leave it fairly thin to where you're not, you know, going to lose detail or create little caves that you don't have enough material in. Getting a little action towards the space again. Ooh, it's getting very, very sick. Yeah, I'm noticing that. Start prepping the next one, yep, I think we are ready, Ted. If you want to get the next batch, we're one starting in, to cream. Uh, a half yeah. to one or a one, one or two? One part water to two parts. Okay. And that'll give us enough. Go ahead I, and launch these off to save them. Um, yeah, if you can, the, the brush, the thing's there. But, yeah, that was probably... Any imprints we need to make real quick? Could do a cheap and easy life cast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's not cut that out. Okay, so this is our our first print coat, if you can see that. Very thin, very clean. Um, no undercuts, no little drips, because if you get drips that form like a little cave, you have the potential of breaking through that fine little area. And um, when you do your casting, everyone will have a little water dimple. And we're seeing a nice ashing coming up here where it's starting to go matte. <clears throat> so that's exactly what it should be. You don't want to go too far past that when you do your second coat. But we're looking at this point of doing a similar um, mixed viscosity. So like a heavy cream at this point. But all throughout, it looks like we have a nice, thin, even coat. Throw an eggshell. Even in our little undercuts into here, it looks pretty darn good. Okay, that's one to two so far. So it might have to go like two and a quarter, two and a half. Just tapping it out again. I'll see if I can turn this around so you can see. For those of you that might have missed it on the first go around. So 
So this is the second batch that we're doing. It's a one part water to two part mix, give or take. By tapping the, the edge of the thing, we're knocking some of the loose plaster down into the, the mix. And again, this is Hydrocal, not a regular old plaster Paris that you would get from the hobby store. Hmm. Another cool thing about Hydrocal and Ultracal is that um, being an alpha gypsum, sometimes you have a slight expansion with Hydrocal and Ultracal, whereas with most other plasters, it actually shrinks a little bit as it cures and dries. Um, this doesn't do that. It's much more true to the uh, original sculpt. Okay. This is where we really need to move quickly because you see it's going quite matte. They cannot see their um, oh yeah, that's right. We're on the other thing. It's it's getting very matte now. Um, we can spin it around. As long as it's still what they call green, you're okay. But usually the the litmus test is when it um, when it's actually starting to get whiter spots to it. That's like the death knell because then it's gone through its cooling process. So the faster you can get your next layer on, the better. And literally, you guys are spending some time on a Saturday watching substrates dry. <laughs> I'm sorry. But they're so fascinating. Watching paint dry as it were. Okay, let's see the consistency of that. Maybe a little bit more, but we are really pushing time now because that's mm -hmm. starting to really ash. Oh, it's definitely going away from, it's going past satin now. It's getting ashy. Yeah, getting very matte. So we're just going to go through one more cycle of the dry cracked earth. And you have to be patient. It's like, work fast, but be patient. I know that's oxymoronic. But you have to let it go through its process. If you don't, you're going to have lumps that form in your plaster. And then those are drier areas that are then weak. And in your first two coats, that needs to be as strong and as solid as possible. <laughs> oh, Grayson. Well, I'm glad that you joined us, and I know you're not tuning in just to see this creature. You're seeing, seeing your girl in action. She's blushing. I had a lot of um, stage fright, especially doing stuff like that in front of people, you know, any kind of mold work or makeup stuff or anything. Um, luckily, by the time... I was on that show. Um, I had pretty much gotten away from that kind of fear. We're going to the agitation again. Probably not going to spend as much time in this just because we're running out of it so quickly on this um, first coat. Oh, and it's a timing thing. We just have to move so quickly at the stage, but still be precise in our application and worry about the air bubbles that are ultimately going to make it weaker. Okay, enough of the big ones are gone. Not a perfect world, but we have enough of the, the big ones gone. Um, first thing I'm going to do is go back to that little fan brush, and I'm going to build up a little bit more under here. Chelsea, if you want to go ahead and start working the, the, top. the top part down. And I am going with such a light touch on this area down here, almost not even putting brush pressure. It's more just allowing the material to flow off of the brush because we don't want to displace anything that we just put on. We're more building up those undercuts. And re-wetting. And re-wetting, which is very, very important. we got to keep this thing in a constant state of green, which means uncured. I'm just hearing the music from the control, Central Park in my head here. 
more pushing it into the areas that we need, gliding it over the surfaces, making sure we get good coverage, but all the while we're burping out little air pockets. I was fortunate to have good teachers and good people that, that helped me out in a time when we didn't have such ready access to this stuff online. Could you imagine a time when there was no YouTube videos or anything like that? You're showing your age there. Yeah. But there were people like Dick Smith that had magazines, how to be a special effects mask maker or a prosthetic maker. Um, you know, back in the day, it was like you'd, you'd find someone that did it in your area and take on a, a, a mentorship apprentice type situation, you know, and then they would be good enough to teach you. I had several of those people in my life. Um, here in Orlando, there was Rick Gonzalez and Michael Davey and uh, my good friend Alan Duckworth. Um, you know, there there were a handful of guys that really um, helped people. There was a place, Paramount Theatrical, where they uh, often would show up and work. And if you came in there with any questions on how to do this or how to do that, um, they would be there teaching you the ins and outs and giving you tricks and tips when you had problems with air bubbles or pockets or you know, consistency of material, or what the heck do you paint a latex mask with? You know, they were very good with their information. And then years later, I was able to take a hands-on course with a good friend of mine, uh, Joel Taran. And uh, we met through a, a television show that he was tapped to do. And um, he kind of showed me how to do this stuff firsthand. You know, because there's, there's so much that you can learn from watching and, and kind of reading about. But the only way you can really do it is by getting in there and getting your hands dirty and unfortunately failing a few times. I learned a lot more from my failures than my successes with this stuff. Any material that I ever had to use, I always learn more from the mistakes. You know, oh, we're not going to do that again next time. <laughs> But it was always a learning experience. And then after that, I was lucky enough to um, be able to get into the Dick Smith professional makeup course. And um, his, his course is probably, for the money, one of the best courses that you can take. There are a number of schools now that you can go to. But at the end of the day, if you can take the knowledge that someone like Dick Smith, um, through his, you know, through his old, old apprentices, they have now taken over a lot of his classes. Um, my mentor in that class was, uh, amazing. Um, very, uh, very good about getting back with me on, on, uh, information. Andrew Clement, an amazing special effects artist in his own right. Just amazing. <laughs> so you see we're just going through here and continuing to build up these areas. And if we have like a little pocket, we got to fill that kind of by pushing the material in there. You can't brush it because it'll just continue to brush out. So the thing that we're fighting on this layer is that the undercoat is already starting to set. So we have to fight that as well as the material that we're putting on there is wanting to do its thing and chemically set. But it's getting nice and creamy, almost like a cool whip. How many coats do you apply, Lurleen is asking. Um, this one, um, general rule of thumb is I don't necessarily always go by a number of coats. I go by a thickness. Um, and with something like this, 
you probably want around one inch. Um, you're not going to hurt yourself by doing more, except it's going to be heavier to lift. But um, at least one inch for something like this, because it's going to have to take a lot of punishment. You put um, oh. basically a mold strap on it. Check that out. Starting to set. In the brush. That was weird. Thank you. Where's my star? But, um, yeah, one inch, um, you know you're going to have enough uh, stability and strength in the mold to uh, support the mold strap. Because the mold strap actually has one of those kind of like a ratchet. a ratchet action. So when you pull down on it, it actually puts a lot more pressure and keeps those mold lines lines tight, those mold edges. The brush was too wet. Okay. The brush was wet. I saw uh, some waters. Okay, we're ready for the next batch. Okay. Um, larger batch? Um, no, or, I would still Are we still doing another uh, print? No, but I would go with um, about the same batch size. I don't want to get too far ahead and have a lot of waste at this point. Okay. We are already super ash over here. And the thicker you go with your batch, because this stuff is ma um, mass sensitive, so the thicker you go with your batch, the hotter it's going to get. And when it, if it can get too hot, it can distort as it cures. So we don't want it to get too hot. That's why we're continuing to work that edge and kind of just throw material on it. We're not really brushing it as much as we are just depositing the material on there. It's a very tactile thing. you got to do it a few times before you feel comfortable with the whole process. Sort of like the spatula for a cake. Yes. And if there were more horizontal, if we could actually get to it, you'll probably see that technique as we're able to flip this on its back and do the face. But you'll see that we actually do a splash coat where you're you're more flinging and dripping the material on once you get the details covered. And that gives you a much better uh, fill of material. I had such water that this was a wash brush. Puddled a little? It did. I think I sweated out evenly. We also have a goodness. Outside, so it's humid. Humidity will definitely affect how this stuff sets. Except it usually prolongs it, not hastens it. Yeah, but you see how how you know by continuing to move material around and keep that a little bit wetter. That way we maximize the life because it's definitely getting creamier. <laughs> But we don't want to overfill those gills quite yet. We have a lot of um, material that's on there, enough material to fill the major parts of the undercuts. And now we're just wanting to kind of keep it even and wet. Sweet, what I'm focusing on started going eggshell. Yeah. Yeah, the eggshell is kind of an enemy. Because <laughs> that means you got to work faster. But you're constantly watching for air pockets, air bubbles. Water. You can just add a little more in there. You are going to get some drainage. Um, it's almost like the material that you're putting on there is sweating a little bit. That's normal. But you may have to um, adjust um, your material. Keep it thin, work out peaks, work out caves, air pockets, air bubbles. It really always amazes me when, you know, someone will spend weeks on a sculpt and then pack a mold together really quick. And, it, you know, it's, it's true what they say, that your, your art is only as good as your mold in this case because it has to be right. If you screw up your mold, every casting you do after that is going to be fouled. See more places we can put anything? Or just keep working it? Uh, I think we're past the point of really working it. I'm just going to get a little bit more on this mold wall. Still watery down there, by the way. Yeah, we'll just let that start to set. And we haven't quite gone eggshell throughout. 
How are we on that? I'm just waiting for that little peak to uh, back up. Is that on the first first phase? Hmm? First phase of um, dry cracked earth? Oh, no, this is, uh, I've already got two cups and a tiny little bit more. In. Oh, okay, good. Good job. Almost done here. And that's good timing then. And this is the splash coat? <laughs> That's what works. Um, no, we probably don't need a splash coat on this because it's so vertical. We'll just continue to build up. Uh, yeah, air conditioners for sure. Um, usually, though, like we have an air conditioner in our shop. It keeps it around. Like right now, it's at about 80 because we have the door open. But generally, we like to work around 75 degrees. Um, but you can trick it by icing the water, using colder water. Um, but, you know, it'll be melted by the time we're done with it. But at least we get a couple of coats on if we need it. But we're moving pretty good on this. It doesn't feel like 80, does it? No, because the humidity, it feels a lot cooler. You know, cooler and everything. It's more like a 76, 4, maybe. Now, the good thing is, is once you get through the first couple of print coats, you're pretty good. You don't want to get too lazy, but if you have to, uh, if you find you have a little bit of air bubbles in there, because now it's really going to start to ash quick. You have the heat generated from the first coat and the dryness, and then you're putting another coat so you have the mass and the heat generating from that. So it's like every layer you do, it gets hotter faster and starts to ash faster. So sometimes if you have to um, forgo a step like the, um, you know, the air bubbles and stuff, that's the time to do it because you're already two coats in. The consistency is really nice. And after this one, we could definitely get a little bit thicker with it and go with a more creamy look, but you don't want to go too thick or too, um, you know, too thick in material, putting on too much at once, or have too thick of a viscosity because at that point, you're generating so much heat that cracking and warping that I was telling you about, that could happen at this point. <laughs> okay. That should be good. It's okay. We'll work it in there. Um, the next stage is going to be interesting. Um, depending on if we can fill up all these undercuts under the gills, um, it's either going to be this one or the next one, but we also have to add reinforcement into this, and that is in the form of burlap. <laughs> now, the burlap we use is actually from the um, the uh, garden, center. garden center of Lowe's, and the reason we do that, thank you, Chelsea, mm -hmm. um, the reason we do that is because the mesh is a lot um, looser. It's, it's m more... Um, like not quite as tight as what you would get for a garment type burlap. Gives you more holes and plastering. Yes. And you do a couple of layers with that and you have the strength. We're continuing to work it in around those gills and make sure we have enough uh, coverage because ideally by the time this is done the gills will have a lot of strength in the form of um, you know building up that mold around them so it's pretty much flush and I'm just keeping the ashy areas from ashing completely Continue to work and, and burp out any kind of air that you see. <laughs> For the burlap layer, do you want to go to a, a, a double or a one and a half batch? Um, yeah, I think if we did a one and a half, I think we're going to probably have one more coat of... Okay thinner stuff and then we're going to move on because we barely have even a quarter inch. Eight. 
So we got to build this up a little bit more before we start throwing some burlap. And we need to eliminate some of these undercuts under here. Okay. So once this gets creamier, we'll be able to kind of pack it in there now that we got a couple of, you know, eighth of an inch thickness there. What's that? This undercut too. See, this is a good example of what I'm talking about. If we were to let that just hang there, it becomes a barrier for being able to get more material in. So we definitely want to avoid things like that and continue to just lightly tap it so we can get more material but not have any kind of overhangs like that that would prevent us from getting material in to fill those voids. Air bubbles are our enemy. And I found that a quite uh, a quick um, kind of tapping motion will um, break up those air bubbles and allow you to get material in there. And I know that a lot of this stuff just seems so anal retentive, but there's a method to the madness and a reason for this. It's not just about it being a pretty mold. It's about it being functional. And you can see now it's, it's starting to cream nice again. It's starting to pick up a little more body. It's like a pancake batter, maybe a little bit heavier. So we want to continue building up material around undercuts and areas that need to be reinforced. I would almost describe it like a loose shaving cream. Yeah, very, very loose um, shaving cream. Shaving cream is very aerated, and this isn't quite like that. It's it's solid. But, waffle batter. Yeah, like a waffle batter or something. Instant potatoes with too much water. <laughs> And, you know, never, ever, ever feel like, oh, well, I have all this material mixed up. I have to use it. It's better to learn from it and, and you know, pitch a batch rather than working it too much or overworking it to the point where it's, it's um, working against you. You know, right now it's at a good, a good consistency, but within the next few minutes, it's going to be unworkable. And you got to know when to say, okay, that's it. That's too much. We'll just... Let it go. So the Elsa. Yes. Ha! <laughs> I'm fighting that quarter all this time. Yeah, if you need to use the canned air if you're getting an ugly bubble. It wasn't necessarily a bubble. It was just um, the brush is too wide both ways. Uh. Yeah, we're using two-inch brushes. You could also use one inch if you need to, or use like a fine art brush. You're not going to ruin it by using uh, using a regular brush on on um, like a stone material like what this is. Just clean it. Clean it immediately. Don't let it solidify in there. Wash is out of clothes too, pretty well. Kind of turns to dust before you actually have an issue. <laughs> Yeah. Whoa. That was a big old overhang. Yep. Got it. Okay. <laughs> I don't know that I need to do that this time out. Cardi Asher. Okay, Ted. I think we can go with the next batch. Okay. Just get new brushes again. Yeah. Okay. Yes, you will go through a lot of brushes. Washing them, there's always a risk, like I experienced earlier, where they're a little too wet still. 
Yeah, if they trap moisture in the brush and then start leaking that into the plaster, you're doing the same thing as working with an oversaturated amount of plaster, and then it's weaker. Building up this area of the gill without leaving any kind of air pockets under it, but we need to have enough body under there to where we get through this next coat, we can probably do our burlap layer next. If you have too drastic an undercut, the burlap, kind of like working with fiberglass, it doesn't like to shimmy down into those little areas and you wind up getting all sorts of issues trying to laminate layers of burlap into your hydrocal. And the burlap, like I said, all that does is strengthen it. That way, if you break it, and God forbid you drop the mold and it kind of, you know, cracks, it at least doesn't break all the way through. Tell me about mold breaking time on Facebook. <laughs> And you can rinse brushes when you're doing this and get all the material out, but I would not use them. I would let them dry before you reuse them because of that waterlogged issue. Let's see, these are, we're getting there. And I also wouldn't use them on a print coat. Like if you have to reuse the brushes, rinse them out, get them as clean as you can, and then use them on, you know, third coats and ups. Because they can get a little crunchy. Okay. Sorry about that. I know we're having some connectivity issues, but we are two coats in on this, right? Two coats? Three. Three. And then we got a fourth one coming, and then we're probably going to be working on the burlap. We got to have at least two coats of burlap, but really what we're looking at is um, the edge of this mold here. As you can see, that's still pretty shallow, and we need to build that up to an inch. However, very soon, we're going to be at a point where the material that we put on there can be thicker. And between that and the burlap and the fact that it's going to be uh, drying quicker, um, it's going to go quicker at this point. The whole the whole stage will go quicker. One thing we will need to do is moisten those burlaps. Just, well, yeah. given how that's draining, I wonder if we just make sure that we soak it really well. Because then we're going to have just the water pouring off of that thing. I'm sure the draining wasn't because of my brush issue, though. It could be, but that stuff will do that anyway. Just kind of drains as we go. Almost there. And that was another, just the regular batch like we did on these? Yeah, we two in a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I think we're going to be to the point once we get this one on, we'll be able to little, be a little bit more aggressive in troweling material on. And we are just about met. Okay. Are you going to... Yep. For a very short period of time. It's mostly just to break up some break up some of the bigger bubbles at this point. All right, I think that's about all I want to do on that because this is really getting matte now. Okay, so just lightly mix. You don't want to mix more air bubbles in, but just make sure you got no lumps. And then we're going to work from the top down again. 
Can you grab that side if you can? That way I'm not trying to cross over you. <laughs> so did you want these dampened or not? Mm. Damn maybe not soaked. Yeah, don't soak them for sure. Because I'm afraid that we're just going to get a puddling mess if we're not careful. You can see it's going on a lot thicker now. Because we have three layers under there now that are all starting to go through their exotherm. You also don't have to be quite as concerned about it lifting off the right. master. Yep, you don't have to worry about this point so much on your mold walls because you've got enough mass on there to hold the mold walls in place. You're not going to push them over. You've got enough material on the detail of the piece that you're not going to mess up the details there. So you can be a little bit more aggressive. That doesn't mean hulk out and start smashing, but... Yeah, you're no fun anymore. And just think, we only have to do this two more times. At least the front one will be all one piece. Stuff gears pretty quick, though. Yes. That's the good thing about this process is technically we should be able to pull this by this evening. We want it to be at least mostly out of its green phase. As you can tell by how quickly it's ashing, that probably shouldn't take very long. Yep. The mad scientist turned on a moisture sucking machine inside. <laughs> Yeah, this is already getting way ashy. Right. I'm sorry, I'm slipping. That's okay. I flung some over there earlier. And can you do uh, a project like this all by yourself? Um, you can. It's not easy. It's definitely not as fun. Because, I mean, we goof around, and, and it's kind of like a stress management thing. It's a very stressful, believe it or not, you know, it, it's stressful doing stuff, something like this. Um, not only is it your time, but it's your money. It's the fact that if you goof it up at this point, um, you are so far behind, especially, like, the worst are when you have uh, deadlines, and you're working on deadlines, and it's other people's money. Can I splash some there? Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. When it's other people's money, I get very nervous about, you know, you want to be responsible with your client's money. And sometimes saying, uh, I'm sorry, it didn't get done, is not an option. Because at that point, they have film crews waiting, or they have a reason for needing it. And you don't want to have to tell someone that. That's how you get a very bad name in the industry. Or if you sell something on eBay, you know, don't rush it. Don't give them, you know, crap because you're you're rushed. But be diligent in your time and respect it. If someone's good enough to trust you with giving you money to do a job, do it do it right. Don't just disappear and ghost them. I find most of the time, if someone commissions me for something, all they want is updates. If you are running behind, give them updates. Let them know what's going on. Bring them into the process. But in the business, if you're doing it as a business and you're dealing with producers, directors, or effects teams, you're going to really get uh, blacklisted if you start making promises you don't deliver on. It's almost a better idea to under-promise and over-deliver. How's the overhead on the other side? 
Yeah. On this one? Mm -hmm. That one's pretty good. Let's check. I can't see it. <laughs> yeah, I'll keep building that up. I'm watching those sides really, really carefully. I think this is looking fairly nice. Under here is a bit stiff, but burlap's going to be an interesting challenge. Yeah. Well, hopefully as this stuff starts to cream. Maybe it'll stick to itself. Yeah, instead of pulling it all off. Vertical mold is an interesting challenge. Yeah, I told you. <laughs> well, we knew. But since we can't turn off the gravity. Ooh, what would that be like doing mold in zero gravity? Like, like the plaster would just get everywhere. Yes. You'd have to like put it in Ziploc baggies with the end cut off, and you'd have to sort of pipe it out. Yeah. But then how would we brush it on? Take decorating in space. It would splash. Oh, that's going to be the next great British bake-off. I see a face-off reboot happening. Oh. In space. <laughs> Your challenge today is to sculpt a prosthetic, apply it in zero G. On the vomit. Well, yeah, <laughs> welcome to the vomit comment. No, no, Your no. challenge starts now. Like always do underwater application. I mean, technically, you could apply silicone in the water. Yeah. It's going on nicely. And again, as we're working on this, the the actual uh, material that's still in the bucket, um, I'm constantly uh, stirring it at this point because I want to have as much time as I can out of it and keeping that agitated and moving. Where? Um, will it take it? Let's see. Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad at all. This base is going to be nice and sturdy. Seems to be actually out more at the bottom. Again, is unusual because that's where the moisture goes. Yeah. Of course, in zero G, you couldn't have this laying down. <laughs> but what is down in zero G? <coughs> well, according to Ender's Game, it's where your feet are. Right. What's the right preposition for that sentence? I got too excited about making an Ender's Game reference. Well, congratulations. <laughs> the book not the movie. Oh. Yeah, it's getting nice and full of body now. So this is where we're going to want to trowel in a little bit more of the, the plaster hydrocal. Put some down here. That could not hurt. If you want to do that while I'm paying attention to filling the gills. Yep. I've been rounding it off slowly but surely within layers. But... Really does not like this over. Yeah. Pretty sure I just pasted it out two bubbles. As it sets, it almost gets like a slight sculpture, sculpting like quality to it as well. Oh, yeah. Sort of gets soft enough that you can sort of move it in the area. Right, and then it holds verticality and mm -hmm. all that wonderful stuff. But you have to apply it to what's already setting before it does that. Yeah. And then just don't overwork it. Mm -hmm. Let it set a little while. We go into the next layer. Corner. Right? You want me to start the next batch? Yes, and I think this will be a good burlap batch. We'll probably use up what we have here. Okay. Filling the gills and the undercuts a little bit more. 
Sorry, I'm right near a. Uh, yeah, it's fine. Because I see some yeah, scalloped it's... edges over here. And of I'm course, sure it's not. starting to get ashy. Uh huh. That's, that is going to be biggest pain in the rear, that undercut. What one? Under this the one. big fin? Yes. The big, yeah. yeah. That's not a good <laughs> undercut for burlap. Well, then we have to fill it. Mm-hmm. Well, he likes to have a big air bubble there as well. So. Remember another horrible undercut we did on something we're not allowed to talk about? Oh. Which one? <laughs> <laughs> the larger of the two? Mm, yeah, yeah. yeah, there we go. It's really almost on the verge of being unworkable. Because now it's starting to go from mm -hmm. from creamy to like, leave me alone, Pasty. I want to sleep. Should I put one in here real quick? Yeah, if you can. No, that's risky. Just but... make sure that you're burping out air as you go. Essentially the scumbling technique in painting, but with plaster. Yes. Let's see if we can oh, trowel this in here. Chips and paste. Sort of concrete. Oh, yeah. There's something oddly satisfying when it gets to actually do what you want it to do. We're getting a little lip under here now. Yep. Okay. See how that's mm. just troweling in now? but. Mm. We're only going to have like a 40 second sweet spot with it. I'm going to keep this moving as best as I can. We have one more go with this, I think. Okay, then we're going to trowel it here. Just make sure that we're burping out the air. <coughs> Yep, that is starting to get really unworkable. I can't even use my brush anymore. It just glued itself to the bucket. Yep. So we're just going to work out what we have as far as the ugly edges. And that okay. gives us a nice rough texture for the burlap to grab on. Yes. And at least we have enough of a an area in here filled in that as we start laying in the bowl of burlap now um, we're not going to have a danger of it being too much of an extreme angle a whole bunch of comments going on um, Ashy uh, Grayson asked um, is Ashy supposed to happen or is it something to be avoided um, basically when it starts to ash it's well into its cure cycle so what it does is it gets warmer at that point. Uh, all of the moisture now is being basically steamed off, heated off. So it starts to get matte. And at that point, uh, if you go too far past that and it starts going white, not just ashy or matte, but white, um, then it's gone through its complete cycle and you risk a lot of delamination from the layers. And that would be horrible in this situation. Um, I've had that happen in, in print coats early on because I waited too long between layers and literally the first print coat delaminates from the second print coat. So you're basically looking into no detail. And that's really common as well with uh, casting plaster molds because they don't like to, to stick together no matter what. So it gets very difficult. I might want to scroll up. I saw a few more. I can't read them from here because my prescription has changed, but there were some more comments on there. Let's see. Uh oh, Nathan Wilson is agreeing with you. The book is much better than the movie. <laughs> People are continuing to check in. My buddy Roy Woolley joined in. I don't know if you're still here, but Roy, hello, man. I love you, brother. Miss you. More face off alumni. <laughs> what air temp are you guys working at? Right now we are at about 80. It feels just a little bit cooler, but uh, we're working at about 80. And we do have an AC kind of blowing air, but we're leaving the, the bay door open so we get a little more circulation. But about 80. Yeah. 
and R.J. Grady is singing in the rain. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think so far, R.J.? Pretty cool process, albeit a little bit long. <clears throat> yep, Grayson is agreeing as well. The book or, it is better, but he said that they didn't continue the movie series. They marketed it wrong. The that, death of all movies. When yeah. You, when you don't market a movie correctly. Yeah, that sucked so bad. I'm looking at you, Cats Don't Dance. I'm still waiting. Talk about series that did that to you. You don't have to worry about vibration in this because we're going to work so much yeah. air into it. Okay. Um, so that's a batch and a half. That's still very wet, though. You want to give it a couple more seconds? Just a couple more. Want to go ahead um, and free soap? What's that? Should we go ahead and free soap? Yeah. So we're moving on with burlap. We're just going to let it sit as long as we can, probably work on the mold walls. But basically, if you can see this, this is our burlap soaked in the, the uh, hydrocal. We're going to take off most of it, kind of squeeze you between our fingers very lightly, but it's still very wet. And we're probably going to start working on uh, building up a little bit around the mold wall first. So we're about a quarter of an inch in from the edge of that mold wall. Oh, boy. What's the matter? Oh, well, it's sticking pretty well. Oh, yeah. I'm happy. Not bad. Not bad. Vertical molds are always kind of terrifying because... Sometimes, if you go a little too fast with the burlap, the whole thing will just sort of fall off. Yeah. Yeah, and that's usually if you're over-soaking it or it isn't dry enough or it's too much material can even do that because you're putting too much weight on it at once. Yep. Two fingers. Okay. Like this? Yeah. Yep. Squeegee. Just getting most of the excess off. And then once we get up here, we get a little bit tricky because we got to come over and make sure that we have burped out all of the air. It's important to work it with your fingers and burp out all the air. And then we're going to kind of fold it back on itself, kind of like that, and start laying it in that way. That way we have a nice, strong edge. And when you're building it up with uh, burlap, Whereas it took us three coats to get to about an eighth inch. This is where it's really going to build up. And these are somewhat moist, not very wet. Because if they are too wet, they are going to just start oozing water out. Make sure this is all pushed down. I'll uh, get a brush and I'll start tapping. And same thing up here. We're going to start laying it on. And then we're just going to fold it down on itself. But the important thing is burp the air and moisture out extra material out of the corners. Want me to tap you can it use with the brush? brush? Huh? Want me to tap it with the brush? Um, either that or just your fingers. Now, this stuff, especially UltraCal, will really dry your fingers out, so you might have to hydrate after you use it. Um, I find that using gloves is just too much. I mean, I, I lose all tactile, uh, ta tactile it ability with it. It slides out of your fingers. Yeah. So we're starting to just push it in. It's already getting very warm. Yes. And these are going to go fast. But we're tapping it in to all the undercuts, burping out any kind of air. Filling in the holes in the burlap. Yep. Make sure that you don't see a lot of gaps because you need strength in the burlap. Um, Greg asking about um, air blowing on it. Well, air is just going to secure. If you have air blowing on it, it's going to dry it. It's not going to really affect the, uh, the chemical cure, but it could uh, dry it just by nature of having the the air on it. So we're tapping around those gills, making sure that the stuff all hugs the contours of that. Yeah. 
And if there's any area that you definitely want to make sh is sure is totally reinforced, it's going to be that that flange too. Everything kind of needs the benefit of the reinforcement, but that wall takes so much punishment. As it warms up, it's easier to tap stuff out too. Hang on. Oops, that's not snoop. Terrible amount of bubbles over here. Yeah. And here. Watch how dry it gets. Yeah. Okay. Lurleen, yes, that is Ted. As always, he's usually here for these things. I wish I was more ambidextrous. Robot arms like Dr. Ross. Everyone I know knows that I'm molding today, so I'm surprised I would get a message. Thank you, Amber, letting you know that she's not in the room. She'd do better to join the live feed and just don't tell me how that. <laughs> Probably can't get that kind of reception in the car. Yeah. By the way, Grayson, if you're still here, thanks for giving me a little bit of a shopping list on the computer parts that I'll need. Not too bad on the sticker shock. Let me get my angle in here. Boy. <laughs> The nice thing about doing this is by the time you're done getting most of the uh, burlap in there, you've left enough snoo behind that it becomes a nice burlapy mass bird's nest full of hydrocal. And you can fill in these little undercuts even better. But we've still got a ways to make sure that we can fill all this. See how that strength is just increase quite a bit by doing this. There's not an area on here that isn't going to have that network of, of burlap through it. Now there is, you know, regular old um, sisal fiber you can use, um, which I, I kind of have mixed feelings. I was partially, this was because this is the way I was trained with burlap. But the sisal fiber, if you make little bird's nest and puts that in, put that in your mold, sometimes you get a little bit better coverage and strength. But to me, it's just such a mess. But it's always what you're used to, what you learned with, what you came up with. Yeah, almost done with this patch. Well, that went well. That escalated quickly. Just continuing to make sure we burp out all of the areas. As we can, anyway. Yeah. I think one of my favorite parts is once we get all the burlap on and we do the beauty coat. Oh, that's always fun. When you can actually smooth that down. So nice. Yeah. 
even layer of burlap too before that. Though. Yep, we got another layer of burlap, and maybe I don't know. We'll have to see the the strength that we can get out of it, but maybe two or three beauty coats, two or three burlap coats for sure. This is where it takes time. But this is also one of those things that you just can't throw more people at and get done faster. You know, it's in a small shop like we have, most people are surprised to know that we only have a 200 square foot shop. But we use the, the space that we have as, as best as we can and we do amazing things out of our shop. And I think sometimes you have a bigger shop, um, you can do more. But obviously in a job like this, the size of your shop doesn't matter because you're still going to be walking on each other. You know, Gunther uh, uh, chimed in. He was saying that he worked with Screaming Mad George who taught him to use hydrocal and hemp fiber um, for the Space Truckers movie. So, yeah, see, that's a perfect example, you know, using the hemp fiber versus um, this type of thing. Sisletoe is the same basic thing, but it's a loose fiber. Kind of like if you're used to doing fiberglass. Um, maybe under here. Um with that sort of thing, you know, you it's loose. It's fiberglass. You can either have the, the matte fiber or the loose chalk. Mm -hmm. Corner. Yes. And this is this is more of a akin to the the fiberglass matte, whereas the other is more of a loose fiber that wiggles down into the nooks and crannies. Okay. And I guess we're ready to go on to the next, the next burlap layer, because by the time this starts to sit for a few minutes, we'll get that mixed up and on there. You definitely get your hands dirty. That's true for pretty much any art. Yeah. All that worked in. This is essentially like a mini beauty coat. Yeah. Well, you have to be careful with the burlap and make sure that you're working material into the fibers. And that's what I'm looking for is basically all the little edges, all the little air bubbles, air pockets in the edges and the fibers. So I'm not going to find a bunch of weak areas that have burlap but no material. There's what? There was some cracking up there. Sorry about that. Okay. So we've already built up our mold thickness. Our wall now is about at a good quarter inch. <coughs> so I'm going to estimate. We are probably going to need to do um, two more coats of burlap. And then we'll do a couple of coats of the beauty coat. Don't try washing your hands in there. Don't? <laughs> well, it's basically just a slurry of, of plaster. Uh, okay. So you want a double batch? This seems yeah, we can do a double batch on this. There's only the one back there. I know. They left you guys with dead air. I'm just mixing up another batch.
You left these people with dead air. <laughs> but you were in here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just had to wash my hands a bit. Getting a bit crusty. Then it could have been dead air. You oh, haven't have any mold <laughs> problems. Oh, mold or mildew problems. Um, you know, very rarely, um, there's actually more mold in um, the wet clay. We always notice those little black flecks of mold, and it always freaks me out because that's not good for you. But at the same time, um, you know, these, if you store them fairly dry, I've never had a problem with mold. And we have most of ours, um, you know, in our shop. But I've got some that are in the shed, and it's the same thing. Okay, we're at dry cracked earth again for coat number two of burlap. And this one we might try to go instead of vertically, horizontally, and see how that works. That way we have at least some variation of that so we have some crisscrossing going on. Crisscross. Apple Go mama from the train. It does. It literally made the comment, it looks like a giant ear. Kind of could be a giant ear. <laughs> very do camp of us. What? They said, oh, very do camp of us. Yeah. And it's so sad to look at the other half and the front, and he's like, what the hell are you doing back there? <laughs> but, you know, we're making progress. And when we actually move on to this side, we basically just have to create the mold wall on this half, and then this comes off. So that goes quicker. And then when we do the front, we've got no clay work to do. Woo! So the only thing we may have to do is lift this somehow or move the whole thing around in the plastic under it. And that way we can get the front. Because it's going to be a real boring video if you watch us just molding a side you can't see. <laughs> but it's really going to get interesting once we can actually get to the front. Because then we are going to try to lay it down. Um, we'll use a rasp. Um, or maybe even uh, an angle grinder to get some of this off, but his fin comes out so far, we'll probably have to brace under here so he's not actually on anything important. I mean, they're already watching plaster dry. How much more do you want That's to That's true. No, that's true. Uh, Lerley makes a comment, if you spray the mold with hydrogen peroxide, it'll kill the mold. Uh, I don't think it'd hurt the plaster. That's probably true. Between that and some Clorox, you could probably get it taken care of. Tea tree oil? Yeah. So that would sting us. Yes. Okay. There we go. Okay, we are ready. All right. Back on with our task. Yeah. And let's try to do um, maybe do two uh, layers of burlap at once, mm. and we'll start horizontally on this pass. Okay. And if we have if it's too long, we'll just fold it in on the ends. You don't want to do too many layers of burlap at once because it's hard enough to make sure you have material throughout, but you definitely don't want to see the effects of you know, air bubbles throughout because it's just too thick to get the material through. So we have to be very careful about this process and just hope that it doesn't want to slough off, fall down on us. Seems that it's kind of setting so quickly that we're not having that problem. Sort of gluing itself to the base. Oh good, this one's a shorter bit. Careful, careful. Watch your fingers. They're dripping all down the side. Oh. Make me crack. Okay. 
you got to be so careful about where your hands are because if you're dripping material onto the piece that you haven't molded yet, you're going to have to clean it up and then you're damaging the detail. Oh, luckily you did already spray it several coats of protective surface already. Yeah, but no release. Oh. We're only working the release on the area that we have. So I'm probably, you guys keep layering. Mm -hmm. I got to get a brush and just quickly clean that off. And then I will jump back in. Luckily, it isn't a bad cleanup. At this point, it's just for a dried up cleanup. <laughs> yeah. At this point, it's like a bird got him, you know? That's been there for a while. But so if you. If you get it while it's still wet, you avoid having to scrape it off. It's bad enough with the wet clay because it wants to stick, but it'll also rehydrate. Okay. Oh, bitter. If you're having a problem working fingers in, grab one of the brushes and tamp it in that way. Okay. That would Actually, easier here. because I can sort of get these corners and really apply some pressure. Yeah. Whereas a brush would kind of just get the surface bubbles, you know what I mean? Right. Just tell me when to move it. I get zoned in thinking about something bubbles. Yes. Josie Megan, bubble hunter. <laughs> hunter. <laughs> it's not bubble hunter. I'm hunter. Hunter. <laughs> it seems like a very uh, a very low key version of achievement hunter. <laughs> yes. Well, you find all the bubbles. Got to catch them all. Okay, beautiful. Okay. It's very dry. This one is going to. Okay, I will suction cup it on. Oh, it loves these folds. Is that good love or bad? It's not pleasant love. Oh. Uh, Gotta be careful under these gills. Interesting issues. You mean like wanting to pop back out? Yeah. So this with the weight and the material, I think will be better. No, I, was I just, just got that. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I was just thinking. Um, the bird sound song is so pretty and 
peaceful and calming, and then I hear a little wet. <laughs> <laughs> like you do. Okay, we're going to have to smooth some of this out. I see a lot of patches. Let me go ahead and get some material in it. Okay. And then we'll hit it again. I just want to be sure that we're not losing a lot of material and getting weak spots. Did I splash on the front? No, well, a little. Um, there is a brush over here, the blue one, if you want to clean that off. Sure thing. I'm just going to tap some of these areas. Oh, and I see that there's a little bit more here on the back fin or on the back gill. Hmm. Need to get that off. That's really looking good, guys. You see right back here? This area back here, it got a little drip too. Oh, it's still wet. Yeah. Fish. Wet fish? <laughs> I mean, technically, yes. Isn't that the idea? Uh, how thick the walls are going to be when it's done? It's going to be about uh, an inch. Um, if we can cheat it up a little bit. Probably a little thicker because of the size of the mold. This is a full head and bib. So we can either reinforce it with like pieces of wood or just go a little bit heavier. I don't want to go too heavy because then it's going to be very difficult to cast and maneuver. Especially if you have to hand photo cast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think we're pretty much at the end of the usable material here. Thinking one more burlap or are you thinking beauty? I think one more burlap will get us to the proper proper thickness. We are very close. We are very close. We just need to make sure that we're getting everything around the flange. Um, you know, I mentioned clamping clamping the, the, the flange, you know, when you're actually putting your straps on but another thing that you have to be careful about is when you're demolding this sucker that's where all of your strength needs to be in those mold uh, walls because that's where you're prying all your pry points are on that and if you have a weak mold wall or it's too shallow um, you're going to lose your mold wall you're going to have just a fracture I don't care how much burlap you put in it so you want to have enough strength in your mold wall And that's regardless of whatever material you're using, whether you're using epoxy or, you know, uh, resin, fiberglass resin, you know, whatever. Even silicone, you know, it doesn't necessarily have a mold wall per se, but if your mold isn't thick enough, you're going to have all sorts of uneven wear and heat wear. And never hurts to think ahead as to where you think you might have your pry points in something like this because you can kind of plan in advance, you know, how you're going to mold it, how you're going to demold it, what you're going to have to deal with from all these different aspects. Some of it you just have to learn by doing and screwing it up. And luckily, I'm not seeing any kind of drainage coming out of this, so it's still, it's staying very, very well hydrated.
Do you want to just keep evening that out? We've got a little divot in here and here that we can kind of fill. <coughs> Is it going to be a bust or a mask when finished? Uh, Nathan, that's going to be a, a, a mask for the creature event. So this will be a wearable mask. Uh, that's looking pretty good. I think we're ready for it to start going through its cycle. Cycle, and by then we'll get our last layer of burlap, and then probably a couple of beauty coats. We just have to really watch this wall because we are only at about maybe on the far side of um, quarter inch. All right, I'm gonna go rinse my hands real quick. I need to get a slurry bucket over here. <laughs> here, Matting out nicely. Let me just use a brush and clamp it on this time. Or? Yeah, if you want to, that would work. We are almost ready for the final layer of burlap, and then a couple of layers of beauty coat, and then we're done with side one. And it's only 311.
I know we're going to need these on the front. The mm. one inch. Yeah. With the detail post? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is that time? <laughs> All right, final coat. It's so nice to have an edited version of this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sped up, maybe. Yeah. I do wish you could do that in real life. Yeah. If you want to fill up the dead air, we can always talk about what we usually talk about. Uh, if you had one superpower, what would it be? I don't know that speed would help us now. We can have all the speed we want, but material still takes time to cure. Okay, but what if you could speed up an area, like an area effect? Uh -huh. Or you just speed up the cure time of materials. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. That would be nice. Or affect in any direction the cure time of materials, so you can have a longer pot life if you need it, and then have it snap cure. That's Those are rather selfish superpowers <laughs> to have. <laughs> What's your superpower? Well, it applies only to my industry. Well, no one said it had to be a superhero power. <laughs> if you need to save someone from a terrorist no. attack, think of that ain't going to help. Well, think I guess it could. Chemical think reaction. You think of more and ability. You could also slow down their time. Yeah. So like, maybe they were going, I don't know, a foot every hour. Yeah. I can go super slow. Flash time. Exactly. If you think about it, you could apply almost every superpower to some application. Anything you think of. Because the limits your imagination. I think it'd be really cool to speak every language. Mm. You'd never get lost anywhere. As long as you found someone who was good with directions. So men would still have a problem with that if they'd ever ask. <laughs> I 
I can speak every direction, and I'm not going to ask you where I am in every direction either. <laughs> Gonna be lost in every direction, every language too. So we should title this video series "The Shape of Plaster." <laughs> <laughs> Nobody get any dirty ideas. You ever think about the downsides of superhero powers, though? Like flight. Everyone would love to fly, right? Yeah. But wouldn't you have to like obey airline regulations and well, you like flight evade. paths and stuff? Yeah, but that means you'd actually have to memorize your flight paths. Yeah. But you'd the thing have that to wear like a little GPS. I know there would be a catch, though. Like, okay, you can fly, but see how that works for you when you're up in uh, the atmosphere. Or, you know, like... Um, so thin, you faint and fall. I guess you want to be lazy and you don't want to take the <clears> elevator <throat> to the second story of a mall. Would yeah. you be allowed to fly up there or would they be, like, no flying rules? Like, they have no skateboards or no heelys. Yeah. I don't know. It would be rather... And how would you regulate it? Yeah. Stop. Come catch me. <laughs> oh, you got to fly, too. Ha! <laughs> Can you imagine the regulations with X-ray vision? We just have them work for TSA. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, I think we're going to be good after this. For burlap, what do you guys think? I think so. Better. Put a little more reinforcement up against this edge here. Right. You can always play that game about degrees of separation, too. I don't think I know that one. Like six degrees like, of Kevin Bacon. Yeah, kind of like a turn on that. How... How, how many steps are you away from meeting someone you want to meet? Like, throw it out there just for... I mean, people have to know either know someone directly or indirectly. So if we throw out someone as, say, random as Danny, for yeah. instance. Uh -huh. Ninja Sex Party. Okay, Danny. Right. How many people out there know Danny or know someone that knows Danny? Ooh. But it's got to be a direct connection. Hmm. Like, guess how many people know? No, no, no. They would, like, um, how many people would know? Like, they would, uh, all of a sudden, someone would chime in and say, oh, you know what? My friend knows Danny, or he's worked with him on this, or, oh, they went to school together. Well, unless they're from New Jersey, I don't think that's happening. Yeah. <laughs> it's possible. But just a fun game you can play, especially with social media, how many people know people. And the, the, if, you, if you include social media, then well, yeah, yeah, everyone. <laughs> yeah, everyone knows something about someone. But it would have to be like a direct relation, like you actually know, him, not oh, I went to a restroom where he was in there once, you know. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there is a story. Yeah. Not one I want to hear. Too late. <laughs> Danny, did you know? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, brilliant. Oh. Lost the floor, Claire. A little bit. I'm getting a lot of text messages. Yeah. I don't think maybe people didn't like our superhero conversation. <laughs> could no. be worse. We could be playing the rhyming game. Well, no, my my daughter is is going through graduation and prom, mm -hmm. so she is shopping for dresses, and I'm getting texts on this is this dress and do you like this one better or do you like that one better then of course trying to coordinate during breaks when we have them
<laughs> incoming message, incoming message, incoming message. I would love it if the Jarvis voice was programmed to say, sir, there are far too many messages. Yeah. Sir, what did you do on social media? <laughs> Well, that's personal messages coming through on the text. So I probably got one party telling me what to tell the other party. And, and they can't just talk to one another. No. Okay. Are we almost done with... Oh, there we go. Oh, oh no. It's a only rush got like half pieces of the upper left left. So. That's good because I think we're pretty much done. With burlap, we'll get to do uh, <coughs> our two beauty coats, which can be a little bit thicker. Two or maybe three. Two or three. Is that edge there by the burlap, is that looking like it's pretty solid? Okay, this one's very thick. It's very thin as here. Okay. But it is it is solid. It's not all air bubbling. Oh, no. Uh, well, air bubbling then. Like this far. Okay. That should be all right then. Well, we'll just keep layering this on. Yep. Getting closer. Yeah. He's scared all the birds. Everyone has to do yard work. Sometimes. And it's a big lawnmower, though. Hey, we're live streaming here. <laughs> At least we're losing all the contours on the gills. They're looking really nice, strong. My brush is solid. Again? Yep. Did it just flash over on you? I don't know. I'm going to get to my secret superpower. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah. From this direction there's almost no definition. It's a white blob. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're doing our job right. We're at least at three quarters of an inch. So between the next two, I'm gonna say we're probably gonna be close to it. Which means close to the three. inch. Okay, so we are ready for first non-burlap coat in a while. <laughs> and I will rinse again. Oh. That's and a half. What's that? That's and a half. Um, or a double. We could probably do a double batch on this one. Okay. But um, make it just a little thicker. Okay. Not quite so watery. I would do that. Oh, wait, wait. Oh. Are you going to wash your hands as well? No. Okay. I will, though. You need to fill it down here. Yeah.
second hand. The air conditioning is making a very interesting sound right now. almost ready. That's going to hand me through those brushes and I'll start pluck them. What's that? Brushes behind you. There's that one. At least this one will go pretty quick. I said so. Awkward silence. <laughs> Awkward silence. I was about to say, uh, I don't know. Maybe start imagining shapes that you see in this blank white space. I've already had a suggestion of an ear. You see anything, Scott? Um, Oxymandu Hydro Cow. <laughs> Thank you, Ted. Kind of looks like a hooded face. Yes. Like one of those uh, creepy guys from the end of Fantasia. Yes. You know, in the big Gave Maria scene. That part always creeped me out as a kid. Yeah. That part. Not Chernabog or anything with the rest of it. That part. Yes. Like, what is with these faceless people with fairy lights and everything? Ugh. Well, you creepy. Know. Chernabog was cool. Those dudes were creepy. Little I didn't miss anything else, did I? Nope. Not that we're you ever uh, think about when you watch movies as a kid and how you misinterpreted what you were watching entirely? Yeah. Like, uh, you ever see Rescuers Down Under? I can't say that I have. No? Got you? What's that? Said, have you ever seen Rescuers Down Under? Yes, a long time ago. And that opening scene where they go across like the field of poppies. 
Azul, I had no idea that those were poppies, and I thought they were like hooded monks, and it used to freak me out. There were thousands of hooded monks surrounding this house in the middle of nowhere. I do remember that one being a little less than the first one. I really liked the first one. Mm. But I was so young when I saw that, too. It holds up pretty well. Yeah. I think the kids just watched it more recently. All right, how's it looking? Almost there, because we are getting very ashy. Mm -hmm. Still moist, but it's getting very ashy. Okay. I don't know how much more I can super saturate this. <laughs> Here we go. Beauty coat. Just start layering it Let's on. Let's go. Oh, that's pretty that's nice. Good. Okay. So this is the first kind of beauty coat. So as this starts to set, we're going to be able to add more and clean up the edges, kind of um, work it smooth. I like to leave a slight texture on it so it's a little easier to grip if you need to. And we'll put a little bit on that edge there. But um, it's, again, personal preference. You know, some people like it shiny smooth. Um, I leave a little bit of texture. Some people leave it very rough. <laughs> that was funny. I just caught a glob on the brush. You caught it? Mm -hmm. Yay! I did, it wasn't intentional. Really wish we could have laid this down. Let me just pour that in there and move, move the material around. Yeah. That's a lazy way of doing it. Sometimes a lazy way shifts fast. This thing must be hot. Oh, no doubt. Is that coat I just put on already a oh boy huh. yeah each layer layer does get successful successively faster to set and cure And usually by the time you finish one area, you're ready to move on to the next, and it's already starting to mat out. Ooh, careful. Oopsies. We have a geyser. A geyser? Oh, we have two geysers. Yeah. One geyser. I need to stir it real quick before it's set in the bowl. Yeah. So we have a lot in the bowl. This stuff is going, going, going. Yeah. There must be something intrinsically wrong with the way I stir. What do you mean? Think about all the times I've gone to stir something and it's like erupted. <laughs> Remember that time with the foam? Oh, yeah. Yeah.
think someone asked a question. Well, um, he was asking about the cure time to where we could pull the silicone. This one's actually going to be latex. Um, silicone, you want it to be good and set. Um, we have done silicone out of a plaster mold within a couple of days, but I, I usually use as my litmus test that it's um, that it's dry because this stuff st tends to stay very um, humid feeling for a while, and I don't really like to put it into an oven or you know a foam oven to superset it or force cure it. And the fact that you don't have enough big enough right now. Yeah, we've put it into hot boxes that we've made out of storage totes, but um, I just like <laughs> to let it cure if you can by by itself. And that, it takes about a week. But latex, you can probably get one out a little bit faster. But we'll have to see what humidity is and how fast it's going to start to, you know, set up on us, cure on us. Because we'll have, this will be going on late. This will be a process that we'll probably get the second one on probably around 7 tonight. It'll be, it'll be getting done. Because we still need to build our clay wall, clean it up, spray it with release, and but it won't be a late night. If we have to, if we just simply run out of energy, we can push it to tomorrow. But I don't like doing that because then you have issues with um, the setting, you know, and one one area being set more than the other and being different in, you know, where it is in its phase. Might just have to let that sit for just a minute starting to get a little bit drippy melting man but definitely want to keep this moving That's good. Setting. Really think it's two beauty coats? Well, the only reason I'm worried is this flange, this fin being so thin. Oh, is it still thin over there? Well, thin. Relatively thin. Relative based on the fact that it's so broad. Mm. If it were just a matter of it being a regular part of the mold, it wouldn't be a big deal. But the fact that it's so flat and so wide with the uh, one inch, it's still a little bit thin by me looking at it. But we'll have to see. But it's definitely starting to gel anyway. For sure. Can you tell by looking at that wall thickness over there where we are? Mm -hmm. Here it's this thick. Okay, so we're close to an inch maybe? Thinnest, it's this thick. Okay, so half an inch. Yeah, if we can build up a little bit more there, I would feel a lot better. Just don't put a pry point there. A what? Just don't put a pry, a pry point there. <laughs> That's not a game I want to play. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's getting very thick. So, so the here. next batch. Um, yeah. Yeah. What was this one? A batch and a half? I uh, know that was a two. Two. A yeah. Let's let's do um, at the most a batch and a half. Okay. Because I'm not going to get this all applied. 
it's really starting to set. So. Thanks for good building the walls. Oh, yeah. All right, now I got a nice thick sandwich one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I wasn't so nervous about this flange, I think that this would almost be done. Plus, it comes down so far on the piece. Mm -hmm. You want to come look at this side? Oh, yeah, that's getting really nice. We're almost there. I think that this one being a uh, patch and a half will be plenty to get that done. We got plenty of thickness here. And I have to really be careful how far I go in if we do have to wind up drilling to make sure that we're not going to hit Finn. So after this beauty coat, we'll take another break? Yep, after this beauty coat, we'll smooth it out, um, get it basically in the finished mm -hmm. um, look. And then on this side, once that's set up enough, we can take off the clay reset a little bit, clean up, and then get the wall here done. And then spray it down, and then we'll be ready to start the next side. So, yeah, it'll go pretty quick. <laughs> Looks like one of those cameras when they just wait for something to hatch. What? Oh. Man, I would not want to see what would hatch out of this. Creature, obviously. I mean, it'd be big. Okay. How are we doing on that bag? More than halfway done. Okay. Do you have a start bag? Nope. That's it. Oh my. <laughs> but we're going to have very little comparatively on the front. Elevation versus the back. Mm. Yeah. Brush. So. Hmm? Brush? Oh, brush. Yes. Another brush? No. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, we got to get moving, 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 because that is starting to really ash up. What are the plans for the body sculpt? Um, get it done before August, actually. Um, <laughs> no, we're going to be sculpting it. Um, 
basically the same way, molding it the same way, um, trying to do it very similar to the way that they did it um, originally for the series. So it will be attached to a bodysuit, um, and then it will be worn uh, down at the Springs event. Um, so we're trying to go for as close to accuracy with the original as we can. I know that the original was done in foam, but that's not going to be practical for this, what we're working on. So unfortunately, we have to take some liberties, but... The creative liberties that makes them the best. Yes. Yes. So this is it, the final coat. Final coat done. Yeah, the internet thing was for that one. No. Oh, I would hope not. That was an awful pun. <coughs> an awful musical pun. Probably not even sung in the right key. Okay, you'll get a cease and desist order from the company that are on the right. <laughs> That's true. But look, it's already oh, yeah. glazing up there, going eggshell on us. I'm going to have to really watch waste on the next two sections. Well, that first batch was a learning batch. Yeah. Like, okay. When did that pop up? Luckily, we won't have to rotocast this. This is something that's going to be. Cast. Yeah, you kind of get some material in there and roll it around and then you let it dwell. So it basically is just sitting there and then you flip it upside down and let it drain out. It's kind of how they do some porcelain stuff, right? Mm hmm. Not that I've ever done it. Kind of, sort of. We're used to kiln. I told you I missed out at a kiln at a thrift store, right? Yeah. I'm so mad. Lucky, lucky, lucky. If you're leaving brush strokes on it, you're probably scraping too hard. You just want to kind of... I think that's also going a little thin. Trowel it, yeah. Just kind of let it fall off of the brush with, with its own weight. It's also curing incredibly fast. Yeah, well, it's quite hot. I can feel it. <laughs> mm. Even with the cooler stuff going on over it, you can feel it. We're going to construct another hot box to get the clay out. Um, the seam, uh, Jean is asking, will the seam be straight up and around the head, or will it flow within the lines of the skull? It's, um, it's going to be pretty much going straight up because of the way the contours are. Um, we would risk getting some locking. So we're, we're trying to find the most logical way of following the lines without... Um, having a risk of locking the mold on us. So we'll have some cleanup, but you always do with these things. Ed is getting rid of some of the plaster buckets. Yeah. How's uh, the thin thickness looking over there? Oh, good. Very good. Oh, good, very. I'm getting that nice round support curve down here. Yeah, I made a trivet for you. <laughs> <laughs> 
Lovely. Gee, I didn't get you anything. Actually, you know, that wouldn't be a bad base to sculpt like a wound plate or something. Yeah. Okay, I think we're good. It's okay. definitely eating it up. It's going to be fun to try to brace this on those areas in here we're going to have to put foam foam in there to hold it what happened to those egg carton foam things egg carton foam things Remember? we've got them they're somewhere around here just use those. sometimes i use plastic bags yeah only well, because we recycle them so sometimes we end up with many large bags filled with plastic bags that they make really good cushions for stuff like this right plus recycling whenever possible you know doing this type of work we've talked about it before it's you know it generates a lot of waste and you try as much as you can not to have excessive waste but you can't always help it mm -hmm. And try and lessen the impact though in other ways. Yep. You just got to use your brains, and <laughs> I'm still surprised how many people just throw paint and oil down the sewers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It'll leave a lovely grease ball for someone to have to clean up. Right. Okay, once this ashes, then we'll be able to smooth it, continue to smooth it with the brushes. Looks like we're good and thick on it, so. Mm -hmm. Air on the side of caution with this, we get one chance. Make the little scrub brushes. Hmm? You're making little scrub brushes? Yeah. What? Oh, I'm there. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not using UltraCal because it's a little more dense than uh, HydroCal, and we need it to be uh, quite hydrophilic to suck the moisture out of the latex for the dwelling process. You can use UltraCal, but it's so dense that sometimes that dwelling process can take longer. So that's the only reason. Okay, hopefully we need a little scrub brushes for the, for the eventual smoothing of this. Oh, it's creaming so nicely now. Oh, boy. On this corner down here that I was worried about. I made sure to fill that in, round it out. I always like rounding out my corners and my molds. Yeah. Feels stronger. <laughs> Sounds like a weed eater. Oh, that does suck. 
I feel for you. Oh, really, dude? Nice and beautiful. Mm -hmm. One. What are you laughing at? I don't know. When you said, oh yeah, I was thinking of the Kool-Aid man, so I don't know what he's laughing about. No, I, I go. Yeah. One. Then there's two. And then three. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. It shouldn't be that bad. This was the hardest. First side is always the hardest. It's kind of warped there. I know it's from the other layer. I think I haven't been able to wiggle it down. Oh, look at that. That's nice. Good texture too. Yep. Good finger grips for it. Like the little pills. Yeah. That reminds me of those stucco balls that popped in the 80s. Yeah. We might not need to burlap this. Mm -hmm. No, its timing was just so perfect on it. Yeah. Gets to this point and it's like, you know, traveling on drywall mud. <laughs> Granted, it's only a very fine window to jump through, but. They just look so pretty. <clears throat> so. So that, my friends, is the first, I guess you'd say quarter or third. I don't know. It's a quarter of the mold surface, but... How about the first side? The first side. There we go. So um, we've got it all smoothed in. That's our beauty. So it's nice and smooth. There's no little areas for you to catch yourself on and get cut. So we have about, uh, I guess, 20 or 30 minutes before we're going to be able to actually demold the, the wet clay from the other side and get things repositioned so we can start taping on that. Um, so that is basically where we are. Um, if you have any other questions, go ahead and, uh, you know, ask them. In the meantime, we've got some cleanup and reset to do before we can move back on to wet clay, but um, that gives you your idea. Um, so anyway, we're going to go ahead and end this live stream. Uh, part two, and we'll be back for part three in a little while.